It's time to strap in and get ready for the front stretch. Presented by Joe's Carding. Dan and Dirk are live in the studio today, ready to hear from you at 402 573 0590. Well, good morning to you, race fans, and welcome to the front stretch, broadcasting live from Newton, Iowa. Was the home of Maytag, now it's the home of Iowa Speedway. I say now as if it's late breaking recent news that's been going on for a little while and if you haven't figured it out shame on you the fastest short track in america it was a great race last night it's great racing action and unfortunately sound the trumpets the season's over with for iowa speedway we All go six the, weeks of it we go into the off season and i don't get to hear from the marketing director anymore yeah. <laughs> 12 <laughs> emails a day <laughs> between him and the pickups contest that's the only emails i get <laughs> And my Speedway Motors uh, sales that I get, I guess that's me. Which I don't even know why I subscribe to Speedway Motors because I don't, I can't buy any of their stuff. I don't own a race car. Yeah, but I'm surprised it's not on your Ford pick 'em up. That's true. That's very true. All right, we got a big show lined up for you today. Turn number one, we are going to talk a little bit about Indy. To be honest with you, there's not much to talk about Indy because Kyle Busch took the entire field out to the woodshed and went to town. Uh, then we're going to, uh, so we'll mostly talk with Stan Caesar quite a bit. That's if Stan has rolled out of bed yet. He's had a late couple of days, so he's he may be kind of uh, catching a few extra Z's. If Stan's not able to join us in turn one, he'll join us in turn four. We'll recap Eagle. I'll talk a little bit about the I-80 results on Friday night and uh, some of the uh, local dirt track action that has happened throughout the area. And then turn two, we sat down with Brandon Jones, driver of the number 33 Menards Chevrolet for Richard Children's Racing, while we were here at Iowa Speedway yesterday and did a quick interview with him. So we got about, uh, what do we got, about 10 minutes, 12 minutes with uh, with uh, Brandon Jones. And then at turn number three, we talked with Eric Jones. So what, what was your big saying yesterday? We were keeping up with the Joneses. <laughs> Amen. Uh, we were having a lot of fun yesterday as we were uh, walking around the infield talking with different drivers and different crewmen. And so we talked with Brandon Jones and Eric Jones. Those interviews will be coming your way. And by the way, once again, we had another great interview with David Starr. Uh, a guy that, you know, just once again, I, I wish he was a bigger name in NASCAR because I think he could be a very big influence if he had a little more swing behind him. You know, a, a star like like Brad Keselowski or, or Carl Edwards, you know, when those guys say something. And Tony Stewart, when, when he makes a comment, NASCAR listens and, and fans listen to him. And David has got a lot of great things to say. So just because you don't see David in victory lane or or up in a championship fight all the time doesn't mean what he have to, has to say isn't relevant tremendous insight he could uh, quite honestly i i thought about as we were talking to him he needs to write a book on how to find sponsors and hold on to sponsors because i think there's a lot of dirt drivers that are struggling to find that organizational money that i heard her all the time there's just not a lot of sponsorship money out there yes there is you've got to go and find it and you've got to maintain it and 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 the maintaining as if you listen to his interview which we're going to air in a couple weeks so pay attention when that comes on because it's a great great lesson for Mm -hmm. you guys it's uh uh he'll explain to you exactly what you got to do to keep these sponsors i mean this guy's uh up in years lost his ride but was only out of a seat for seven weeks because he was beating the bushes. Now he's back driving a race car. I, and as he says, I'm a race car driver. Mm-hmm. I don't want to be a crew chief. I don't want to be a driver coach. I want to drive race cars. And he does it really well. He was uh, uh, here last night as a part of uh, Massimo Racing. And uh, what they do, they're they're a, like an ATV, UTV kind of a company. Yeah, a lot they, like the, yeah, like the, the big the little tree. four four uh, yeah. uh, four wheel drive uh, little golf cart looking things, but get out in the bushes with and hunt and that kind of thing. So that's going to be uh, coming up in a couple of weeks. We'll play that David Starr interview, but uh, then back to today's show. Intern number four, we will talk Pocono today, which sounds like it might be a little bit wet out there today in uh, Pocono, Pennsylvania. So we'll have to keep an eye on that weather. All right, Dirk, you want to talk a little bit about Indy? <laughs> okay, Kyle Busch won. Next. <laughs> That's pretty much the way it went. Now, unfortunately, I didn't get to watch most of, the, most of this race because I was going off of about three hours of sleep. And so I laid down to watch the race and woke up in Vict- when they were in victory lane. Uh, I caught some inter- some stuff about it later. I, listen, I'm not a big fan of Indy. I just, oh. I, I, I they really. They could get rid of the race, as far as I, I'm concerned. I know. I enjoy Indy. Take that race to Iowa Speedway. Please. Please, I, I really enjoy Indy for the 500, for the Indianapolis 500. I think 
those cars are are built specifically for that track, and and that track is catered to those cars. They work really well together. I don't know if it's NASCAR wants to be at such a prestigious track, or if that prestigious track wants NASCAR there. Somebody said to me earlier this week that uh, Indy wants to be known as the center of motorsports, and in order to do that, you got to have NASCAR there. Well, unfortunately. There's a couple of factors that just play into it's not a good race. I don't think stock cars are good on flat surfaces like that. Well, they are, but not on that big yeah. of a flat surface, yeah. you know. It's and, just and designed wrong. I, I got into a couple of fights on Facebook on Monday and Tuesday because, as always, I, I'm always defending NASCAR until I feel like they really From did the do NASCAR wrong. the NASCAR fans? But, you know, to sit there and criticize NASCAR for only having 40,000 people in the stands, go back and watch the 99th running of the, Daytona, of the uh, Indianapolis 500. It wasn't sold out like it was for the 100th running, and it won't be for the 101st running. That venue is not a good venue for spectators. Well, no, I've, it's not. If you've a- known anybody that's gone to a race there, you get to see about 50 yards. No, Unless you're sitting in the corner where you can see like down the front straightaway and down the side chute, you don't see except what's in front of you. Mm-hmm. you know? Sitting at Iowa Speedway, we're able to see every angle. We're able to see every inch of the racetrack. You can see the apron. You can see it all. You sit in your seats. You can watch these battles go on. You can estimate how they're doing, if they're clear, if they're not clear. When you're sitting at Indy, I mean, you, you're basically like you were kind of getting to about 50, 75 yards is good viewing, and then you're seeing dots. Exactly. Basically, you, you can't you, see you can't, perception. You can't sit in the grandstands in the front and see the back straight away. It don't happen there. And if I'm a, if I'm a NASCAR fan, and honestly, I've got a lot of bills today. I'm not paying the money to go to. I mean, we talk about how ticket prices to go to Kansas or to come to dollar. Iowa. Right. It's you know. It, the, the biggest cost when we go to one of these races for us is Motel. And for, for, yeah, is, I mean, it, they're, they're a lot more. I, I went to the IndyCar race here at Iowa Speedway a couple of weeks ago, and it was 10 bucks for me to get in, and it cost me 140 bucks to take to sleep that night. So as tired as I was, I drove all the way back over to Omaha, and we, stayed, we got home that night, Sunday night, and it got to work on Monday morning. But it's it's the the not even at the track it's the expense of being there so it is really expensive to go to these things but once you get into there once you get to Kansas Speed when you get to Iowa Speedway there's a lot going on and that's what some people have said well you don't go to Indy for the race quite frankly you go it's kind of like Talladega you don't go to Talladega just for the race you go for the party and that's what Indy's a lot like too so if that's the case okay but I just Indy's not that great of a race, and I would love it. I would absolutely love it if NASCAR and Indy got together in the off season and said, "It's just not working. Let's let's just let's just say, you know what? It's an amicable divorce. Let's walk away." Because currently NASCAR has a five year contract. Uh, they signed a five year extension with all of their active tracks in the off season of this year, in the between 2015 and the 2016 season. So we're at Indy until 2020 at least. So hopefully these two could get together and say. It's just not going to work. Let's go and sell 40,000 tickets at Iowa. Because I think we've been talking about it and asked every time Iowa race comes up, when are we going to get a cup race at Iowa? And the answer is always, who are we going to take it away with? Well, we found our answer last weekend. Well, the the biggest thing, um, it's nothing new. I mean, these, mm-hmm. these races at Indy have been terrible. I mean, everybody that's a fan and that's been a fan for five or six years remembers the race at Indy where they had to change tires every 10 laps yeah, because they had such a lousy tire. But the races at Indy just are not good races, never have been and never will be. What? They get so stretched out with those long straightaways. If you got, if, and, and it used to be, you know, when they had the uh, open gears, you know, when if you got a gear just right, you know, you tore people up there. Now everybody gets a choice of two gears that are almost identical, so that's not as big a deal anymore. But it's, I mean, it's like everybody had a six-cylinder with Kyle having a V8 last week. It, it was, was ridiculous. ridiculous. As soon as he came out of two after a start, he was half a second in front of him. All right, let's turn our attention locally. Stan Caesar has shaken off the Zs and joining us on the phone today, the voice of the Speedway and becoming a good friend of mine. How you doing this morning, sir? Hey, how you doing? I'll tell, I'll tell you what, I've... I, I, I agree with you. Sometimes the races are, are sl- kind of on the boring side, you know. But but if you guys ever think that they're going to take that race away from Tony George and Indianapolis Motor Speedway, there's about as much chance I think of that happening as Shaley Bates, Pig, Miss Smoky Bacon. Uh, you see a flying sleeper flying through the air some night. I, <laughs> I just I just don't think it's going to happen. I think I think they should probably take 
take a, take a race away from somebody else. You know, we talked the other day when you and I talked about this subject, uh, you know, some of the different tracks they could take it away, but they're all in big major market areas. Mm-hmm. And and NASCAR wants to present in those major markets. You know, it's really more about that, I think, sometimes than it than it is the racing. Yeah, you're probably right. There's a lot of politics that go involved in all of this stuff. And, oh, and, and Dirk and I talked. Dirk and I talked about it with Pat Warren. When, all that was involved with him and Talladega getting their races just switched, and they're in the same com- They're owned by the same company. They're under the same NASCAR umbrella. They're friends. It took a lot to do that. Uh, better yet, take a race away from such a big race like Indy. Yeah, I mean all the sponsors and everybody involved. That's that was what he was talking about. Mm-hmm. And it's a traditional deal. You know, there's a lot of races in the surrounding area leading up to that race. There's, there's yeah. races at IRP, you know, the races at Kokomo. They draw all those fans into the area, and then a lot of people prosper in, in you know, what it brings into the economy. They're not, they're not going to give it up, in my opinion. I don't think, I don't think the city of Indianapolis wants to give it up. Well, you know what they say, you can wish in one hand and blank in the other and see what happens. Yep. Blank, all right. Blank, yeah. <laughs> uh, <I'll blank. laughs> <laughs> All right, let's talk about Eagle last night. 154 cars signed in to the back gate, right? When, when the dust settled, settled actually, 100, I think 157 cars actually uh, before the, the, the final guys start straggling in there right before we got ready to start things off. 32 race saver IMCA sprint cars. We had a contingent of drivers over from the Des Moines area. One had pretty good success. A couple of them, uh, maybe not so much. One went off on the hook. But uh, uh, great, all in all, a great night of racing. A couple of the A features were just off the charts, one of which being the sprint feature, the other being the A modified feature. Uh, young Jackson sat off 14 years of age, picked up his first ever win in the B, in the B feature, which, and I'll tell you what, we had 29 A modifieds, which, you know, A modifieds car counts haven't been too good around the, around the, the area. You know, last night we had 29 of them in the house. It was, it was a great night of racing. Uh, you know, kicking things off, Napa Auto Parts, Sport Mods, a uh, guy that shows up about uh, every month or so, every time he's in the house, he picks up the win. Lance Sportman out of Beatrice, Nebraska, and I tell you, he swept the icebreaker weekend. Uh, every time he's in, in the place, uh, last night he started deep in the field. Uh, Scott Bivens, the old Spider-Man car out there, uh, had a, looked like he had a pretty good lead on the field. Uh, one of many caution flags. Sportman wrestled the lead away from him and was really starting to draw away. We had caution after caution after caution. Finally, we reached the title limit, and they threw the checkered on that one. A lot of unhappy fans up in the grandstand, but, you know, it, it was it, they, they seemed like they couldn't run a lap or two without having a caution flag. And uh, So Sportman uh, takes the win in that one. In the hobby stock division, another guy, this guy's been on a roll probably the last three or four weeks. He's been in the top four or five right there week after week after week. Last night he put it all together. Big Dave Carter out of Fremont, Nebraska, picked up the win. You know, he had a, he came out with a new Big Daddy chassis, the Hobby Stock for 2016. It's a great-looking car, and it's and not only does it look good, it runs good because he's been very, very consistently up in that top five, and last night picked up a very popular A-feature win. In the uh, Kaplan University IMC Modified Divisions, as I said, uh, strong field of modifieds in the house last night, and what a race they put on. I mean, with arguably one of the two best races of the night, Johnny Sadoff, you know, he couldn't be outdone by his son. You know, Jackson's only 14 years old, had a tough field out duel in a, in a tough B feature, and he uh, he actually raced his way into the A feature. He didn't get there by uh, this is all the cars we had type of thing, and we'll start everybody in the A, but uh he uh, he made the A, but but his dad, after a long drought, I think it's been about a year since Johnny picked up an A feature win, and it was good to visit with him and once again in victory lane. We always reminisce about how long we've been doing this thing. Uh, I think the first time I inter- interviewed Johnny was back in the 90s uh, over at Sunset Speedway, and uh, we've been doing it for a long time. Sport Contact feature, it was a wild event, but a uh, familiar name in the, in the winner's circle, your defending champion, Cole Creco, in that 30K machine. Just, uh, you know, when he needed to be fast, he was fast. And uh, he outdo Larry Cronin uh, with a few laps to go and got the lead and never looked back. I get a kick out of those sport compacts because even though people like to talk about how they don't go fast, they don't do um, – they don't have a lot of horsepower behind them, they can still put on a pretty good show. Well, I'll tell you what, especially on a shorter track like that, you know, where the competition is close and the cars are close every lap. You know, when you get on the bigger tracks – Sometimes it's it's kind of like the guys going to a super speedway versus racing at Martinsville, you know. Mm-hmm. Yep. 
But uh, Race Saver IMCA Sprint Car Feature uh, had 32 cars, had four heats last night, had a 16-car B-Main that they only took the top four cars out of. And uh, uh, just an excellent race once again. He had a good racetrack, uh, a good top, a good bottom. Uh, and that's what the, where the guys pretty much were running. Uh, one casualty, uh, Tony Benson, who's uh, he come off a fourth place finish up at Jackson, Minnesota on Friday night. There was one rut in the whole track. It was probably one of the best tracks we had all year. One little rut down in turn one. Unfortunately, Clint caught that thing and he bicycled the car and hmm. uh, car wheeled it a couple times uh, during that A feature. And he was running in the top five when that happened. He had a had a good run going. He's he's currently setting fourth in the national point standing. So he needed a good run. And, uh, unfortunately, he ended up going off on the hook. But it was Sean Pointer, and this is a kid we've been talking about from Brand Island. This is his third year in the sprint car division. Uh, he was rookie of the year in 2014. He's been consistently up in the front the last few weeks. And uh, last night he was out there leading up on that high side. Nate Weiler kept working the bottom, working the bottom, working the bottom, and actually passed Sean for the lead. Bottom started going away a little bit, or Nate started getting out of his rhythm a little bit. And Sean ran him back down, and they raced side by side by side. And, and the, the crowd was going nuts. They got into the lap traffic. Just about the time they get into lap traffic, there was a caution flag. Give them a clean racetrack again. They did the same thing. It looked like in turns one and two, top side was a little bit better. And Sean was able to take the lead every lap going down the back stretch. But coming out of turn four, the top side of four was not as good. And Nate was always ready, able to uh, come back and gain the lead again by the time they hit the line. That, unfortunately, lap traffic was Nate's undoing. Uh, they come down to the end, <laughs> and the uh, lap car was running down on the bottom, and, and you know, Roger on the race team was telling everybody, hold your line. The leaders are coming up on you. Hold your line. Unfortunately, the lap car was running in the line that Nate wanted it wanted down there on the bottom. And uh, Nate, you know, Nate's another guy. This is his third year racing a sprint car. He had never raced anything in his life. He was one of Stu Snyder's crew members. And the neat thing about that race is – Stu and Nate ran side by side and raced each other for probably 15 laps. You know, it was it was pretty much a three car battle. And then the guy finishing in the fourth spot on the podium, another guy that's been very consistent, and he's got one coming here very soon. That's Jason Martin. Martin started 15th on the field, and raced his way up to fourth. A very tough fourth place finish uh, before it was over. All in all, a great night at America's home track and uh, a great crowd. And uh, looking forward to uh, heading down to the Gage County Fair this afternoon. Sprint Series from Nebraska will be in the house along with a couple of the other IMCA classes, I believe Hobby Stocks and Sport Mods. And I uh, got a special race going on down there during the fair, and I'll be heading down there this afternoon. Awesome, awesome. What's uh, on the schedule for Eagle over the next couple of weeks? Well, you know, the big one's coming up on Labor Day weekend. Uh, I, I believe officially 115 entries filed for the uh, Race Saver IMCA Sprint Car Nationals. That's Labor Day weekend. They got a big uh, free practice night in tech. You know, cars will be coming in from all over the country. They got an all day long tech session going on. Every car before they turn a wheel at the Nationals goes through a tech, technical inspection. And that's one of the things that makes the race saver deal really work because they take the cars very closely. Every week the top four are on the front stretch and they get teched for a, an abundance of items to make sure it's a level playing field. Uh, open practice that night, that's free to the public. And then coming up Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, the fourth annual race saver IMCA uh, Sprint Car Nationals at Eagle Raceway. There's a special uh, advanced ticket if you buy a three-day pass ticket, 30 bucks. And I'll tell you what, that's the best bargain on the planet because unlike some of the other nationals, they don't split that field in half, and half of them qualify one night, half of them qualify the next night. Every car had a chance, has a chance to qualify. So uh, I heard that there's probably another 12 to 15 entries that have been filed that aren't on the official list yet. We'll probably get the get the new list wow. uh, tomorrow morning. So we're thinking, you know, if 100, 130, maybe 135 cars or 300, we're going to have well over 100 cars. Friday night mm -hmm. qualifying, they'll take the top nine out of the A feature. That means the rest of that field, which should be over 100 cars, will be back on Saturday and I will do it all over again. And then plus on Saturday night, the Jake Ida uh, Memorial Race Champions. In order to qualify for that race, you must have been a previous track champion, regional or national IMCA champion, currently be in the top 20 in, in uh, national points, or currently be in the top two 
at your track points, and we've got, I believe, 24 cars entered for that one. And that's that's basically a feature of the best of the best. That'll be coming up on Saturday night, and then it all ends up the alphabet soup. You know, we'll probably start with either F, F main or, or uh, uh, G main on Sunday <laughs> afternoon, race our way all the way up, and the top nine cars in the B will uh, will fill out our 27-car starting field, and we start them three wide at Eagle Raceway for uh, 30 laps, uh, the Race Saver Nationals. It's, it's going to be a heck of an event. The following week, then not to be outdone, the annual Nebraska Cup SLMR late models, their only appearance at Eagle Raceway in 2016, along with the Nebraska 360 Sprint Series and the Sprint Series of Nebraska Race Saver Sprints will bring all the local guys back and whoever hangs around for one more race. And uh, that's going to be quite an event, too. That's coming up, uh, I believe, on Friday. I think it's September the 10th. Get all your information at EagleRaceway.com. You can get tickets in advance, or you can get them at the gate, like Stan talked about, for the Race Saver Super Nationals. $10 for the Friday night show, $12 for the Saturday night show, 15 for the Sunday afternoon show, or you can buy all three and save yourself 7 bucks. It'll be a total of 30 bucks. Enjoy your day, Stan. We always do love talking to you, sir. Hey, thanks a lot. We're going we're gonna to listen to the Joneses uh, during turns two and three. <laughs> all right, have a good one at church. Thanks, bud. Thanks. Bye. So, again, that was Stan Caesar, the voice of the Speedway at Eagle Raceway, and in the booth with me on uh, a certain Saturday or Friday nights at I-80 Speedway, uh, calling a couple of races. So, uh, a lot of good things from Stan. I always love, do love talking to Stan. Stan can bring it. <laughs> and he's one of the easy interviews. I just, you just, he's, he's like a car. You put a little gas in him, you, you hit the go pedal, and, and, and you don't have to worry about much stuff after that. It's kind of like Kyle Busch's car. He just sets it in the corner, and the car does the rest. <laughs> probably got cruise control on his car. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I don't even have it in mind. <laughs> Uh, so again, eagleraceway.com for more tickets and information on all of that. All right, 820. We've got about 40 minutes left in the show. Let's take a break. We'll come back and we will sit down with Brandon Jones, driver of the number 33 Richard Childress Racing Xfinity Series car. He was at Iowa Speedway this weekend and we'll talk to him about getting started in his career, some of the kind of career and, and basic personality questions we like to ask these guys. Uh, we got about, uh, seven minutes with him. So we'll be back here in turn number two here on the front stretch on AM 590 Omaha's ESPN radio. Joe's Karting and Council Bluffs has taken a page out of IMCA's rulebook and gone crate. These brand new low emission engines will still have you white knuckling it all through the Metro's fastest indoor facility. Joe's Karting is now friendly for all skill levels with their brand new Honda powered engines. It's time to get to Joe's today and find out what drivers like Jack Dover, Shaley Bate, and Andrew Kosiski have known for years. Located in Council Bluffs and online at Joe'sKarting.com. That's Karting with a K. If you love wings, if you love rings, and all kinds of other tempting things, great times, great food, get to Quaker Steak and Lube. Quaker Steak and Lube is the official watering hole for the front stretch and the best place to catch all the NASCAR action today. Open at 11 a.m. with delivery available to Council Bluffs. Great times, great food, get to Quaker Steak and Lube. Dan and Dirk are rolling into turn two with a little attitude on the front stretch. We do appreciate you joining us this morning as we wrap up the 2016 race season at Iowa Speedway. We sat down with a couple of different drivers and talked to them about their careers, how that started, all that fun stuff. And then there's always that fun question that we come up with about how they would change racing. And, And this isn't meant to be a, well, racing needs to be fixed. You know, this is just a... If there was a perfect situation, what would that perfect situation for you be? And and so we talked to quite a few drivers about that over the years. We had to compile a list of the answers we've gotten because we've got some really good ones there. Yeah, and it's uh, uh, the jo- the answer Brandon Joan gives us is just the opposite of what Matt Crafton gave us, mm-hmm. and that's just their two different perspectives of the right. sport. Right. Let's get down with Brandon Jones, driver the number 33, Richard Childress Racing Chevrolet in the Xfinity Series. He also does a little bit in the uh, Truck Series and looking to find his way up into the Sprint Cup Series. These two guys that we talked to this weekend, their biggest hurdles is trying to find an open ride. Uh, there's a lot of veterans that, not saying they don't deserve the ride, but they're in their ride for the time being. And so it's going to be tough for these guys to break into the sport. But we sat down and started talking with Brandon. The first thing we asked him was, 
to kind of comment about his rise through the sport because I mean he's he's risen up through the NASCAR ranks and through the racing ranks pretty quickly. So here's here's how how did uh, talk about his his um, start to his career. Yeah, we've been uh, we've been honestly really fortunate, and uh, we've been uh, you know a lot of great stuff as we've kind of progressed through uh, six years. I started when I was thirteen turned 19 this year in february so uh, this this little short path that we've been on we've been in uh, some awesome stuff been surrounding our, ourselves with awesome people and uh, it's just kind of you know led to that next step each year uh you know each year we've we've tried to run a series and, and tried to you know kind of get good at that and, and win championships and win races in it and then move to the next one so uh, that's kind of been our, our path and everything but i feel like right now uh, an xfinity this year i feel like i want to try to stay here for a while anyways and try to win some races and try to make a name for ourselves I was gonna say your rise through. You know, you talk about every year you've you've joined a new league, a new a new uh, division or whatever. And, and do you feel like if you're stuck in one for two years, you're like, oh, this is bull- what am I doing? Where's my life going? Well, I think I, I th- a mid career crisis. I, I think now since uh, you know Xfinity is the, the the step below the the cup level, which would be the final step, obviously in your career. I think that's kind of where you settle down a little bit. And try to, like I said, try to get some wins underneath your belt and try to win a championship or two and, and get up there. You started racing at 13, which for a lot of the guys, uh, you always hear about these guys that started racing at 4 or 5. There was a car. There was a, did you feel like you were behind the ball getting started at 13? Getting getting started, I felt like we were a little behind, you know, just in the sense of, of how you race around people and how you do race. You know, that was a, a thing that we really worked on. Uh, the very first race I ran in was at Lanier Speedway in, uh, in Georgia. Uh, and I think there was only like three trucks in it, man. You know, it was just last race of the season. Everybody had kind of dwindled down a little bit. So uh, that was a perfect one to put me in. And it, it kind of had me running around different people like that and uh, and trying to see, you know, how you can bump them and pass them and stuff. So I, I worked on that for a long time. And that was the biggest thing we really did uh, start doing. But now that I, I, I got that down, now it's, you know, kind of uh, learning about the chassis, learning about how to, to really get the setup correct for to, to win a race. So you started in full size vehicles, didn't do any carts or midgets or any of that stuff. Yeah, it was it, it was a, a super truck series, what they called it, what I started out in, and it was very similar to NASCAR trucks, uh, but they ran uh, smaller engines, a uh, little different bodies and things, but they were still big spring type chassis, uh, just like NASCAR would run. Sponsors are obviously a big part of this sport, and oftentimes they could be a fun part of this sport. So what's a couple of things you've got to do because of some of your sponsors, some of the funner things you've got to do? Well, we've done some awesome stuff, man. This year especially, uh, we've had so many different companies on the cars so far this year. I think every racetrack we've been to, we've got a different uh, sponsor on the hood or on the side or everything. So it's been great so far. Uh, some cool things I've been able to do. I'm really, really in tight with a military organization called Hope for the Warriors. So I've uh, been able to do a lot of stuff with the, the military. Uh, I've been, you know, driven tanks. I've uh, shot snipers and all that stuff. So that's been a pretty cool thing to add to our list. I'm sorry. Hold on. Did you just say you've driven a tank? <laughs> we have, man. I uh, <laughs> it was it was a Bradley in Fort Benning is what it was, uh, and I got to go up in there and move the turn around, play with the night vision and thermal and all that good stuff. So it was did a good time. Did you shoot it? Yes, we did it. We did it. Unfortunately, it was in the man. It was a massive field. There was hundreds of tanks probably all all in the area but you could uh you could range stuff out you know and they let you do all that but we couldn't fire it unfortunately oh. but get to drive it around and move the tracks around and stuff so it was cool man did you watch the movie fury and think that's, that's right nothing you guys that's right that's I, was, I, I was i in got the, to drive a bradley that's right i was in the modern day equipment so <laughs> it was pretty pretty cool stab at them but uh you know i've done a, a couple things where we've done store appearances and gone out and uh and, and done big factory tours and and things like that at next year in a few other places so there's been a awesome awesome stuff for sure I bet for sure. Is there a veteran driver that you've been able to lean on in the garage as you've made your way through NASCAR on a regular basis, or is there a, a kind of a group of guys that you lean on? Uh, there's there's not really. You know, I think in, inside of RCR, I, I kind of stick to the Dillon boys. You know, they're always there to kind of to help me out, and uh, we've got a lot of the similar interests and in commons, you know, outside of racing, too, so that always helps when you're going to talk to them or just kind of hang out and, uh, you know, see what they have to say. So uh, in, inside this organization, those are the kind of people that I, I try to surround myself with, uh, but I started out actually with Kale Gale. Uh, and he was, you know, raced in the uh, Xfinity Series for KHI for a while. He's been around trucks and Xfinity cars and everything, and that's who I kind of got my start with. So he's the he's the one I have to credit to try to get me started at least and, and taught me, you know, how to race. So uh, everything else has kind of been falling in place after that. So one question we ask a lot of people is, and I, I should have given you a heads up so you had a little more time to think about it. So because we can edit this, feel free to take time to think about it. But if you were the god of racing and you could change anything about it, I mean, it could be cars could do loop-de-loops along the backstretch. Tires never wear out. It never rains at racetracks. What would be something you would change to make racing better 
for you? Oh, just for myself. I mean, yeah. I'd, I'd have to use some magic on this one, man. We'd have to make it to where everybody else's tires would fall off a little bit, and we'd have no fall off and have perfect setups every week. And you'd show up, just snap your fingers, and you're perfect off the truck. You so know, be like that, a cheat code. That's on right, the, on man. The <laughs> yeah, you start pushing, get, start pushing stuff in the car, and, and, and that happens. So, man, I don't know. That's a good question. That's pretty cool. I think. Uh, I think for for in general, no tire fall off would be pretty interesting. You know, everybody would be just you know all the way out every every single lap, uh, and it'd be fast paced racing the entire time. What are some of your creature comforts that you have to have when you're on the NASCAR circuit? You're out. Is it your phone and a couple of apps? I know I your your PR guy was telling me you're a big Pokemon goer. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I will never pick up the Pokemon Go. That's something that I won't do. He but. actually ratted out Austin Dillon and said the guy never puts his phone down now. Man, those those both of them honestly, I think Austin's got Ty doing it too. Now yeah. they were in the drivers' meeting right before it started, and they were hunting Pokemon area. I'm like, man, what are you guys <laughs> up to? You know, this is crazy. Sure, but of course, them all by landline. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> See, I'm I'm just not I'm just not into the Pokemon Go. Uh, I don't what, know. If, what I don't what know is if an app you're into right now? Are you are uh, you technical? Are you are you? I'm not a, I'm not a huge tech guy, but a uh, couple things that I I've, I've been playing the Crossy Roads a little bit. I've okay. been onto that one a little bit, and uh, Song Pop. I just got back on that. All that right. was that was a past thing. I think it's it's coming back now. I'm trying to bring it back. All right, uh, Brandon Jones, driving number thirty three. Good luck, man. Thank you, guys. And he had a bit of a rough night last night at Iowa Speedway. And, well, quite frankly, anybody not named Eric Jones or probably within the top two or three had a rough night last night. We, we've seen it a couple of times here at Iowa Speedway. Uh, fast cars, those guys that are up front, they're putting down blazing fast speeds. Well, and, I mean, you know, we uh, we always like talking to Brendan Gaughan, and he's had some very good runs up here, but yeah. he was just a he missed it last night, yeah. plain and simple. Uh, and there was some good racing. Uh, Ty Dillon really fought for the win. It turned out to be a gas mileage race, which doesn't happen a lot here at Iowa Speedway because of how small it is. But uh did turn out to be a little bit of a gas mileage race. I didn't hear of anybody that ended up running out after they talked about it for those last sets of what ended up being the last uh, sets of stops. Nobody thought they could make it, and then all of a sudden the truth came out. Yeah. <laughs> they all made it. They all had plenty, I mean. <laughs> And that everybody was just playing a little poker mm-hmm. and, uh, you know, trying to get the other guy just as Brad Kozlowski did at Kentucky. That was the best poker game. All right, let's take a break, and uh, we're going to come back in turn number three. We're going to talk with Eric Jones, driver of the number 20 uh, Xfinity Series car for Joe Gibbs Racing. So we'll take a quick break. We'll come back here on the front stretch on AM590, Omaha's ESPN Radio. Are you looking to book your next outing? Look no further than Joe's Karting in Council Bluffs. Located just north of Bass Pro Shop, Joe's Karting can handle outings of well over 100 plus people. Bachelor parties, corporate outings, team building, birthday parties, and much more. Give Buddy a call today and reserve your outing. Joe's will even work with local restaurants to cater your event. Book yours today at joeskarting.com. That's karting with a K. It's time to get to Joe's and find out what everyone already knows. Joe's Karting and Council Bluffs has taken a page out of IMCA's rulebook and gone crate. These brand new low emission engines will still have you white knuckling it all through the Metro's fastest indoor facility. Joe's Karting is now friendly for all skill levels with their brand new Honda powered engines. It's time to get to Joe's today and find out what drivers like Jack Dover, Shaley Bate, and Andrew Kosiski have known for years. Located in Council Bluffs and online at joeskarting.com. That's karting with a K. Feather the brake and get back to the gas. Dan and Dirk are headed into turn three on the front stretch. And we're rolling into turn number three, just like the big voice guy said. Uh, Hey, don't forget that the fan drive for Joe's Karting is ending today. So you can uh, donate a fan to the first annual fan drive. At uh, Joe's Karting today, they are open today. Uh, the other location you could have earlier this week would have been the Creative Element, who helps us get the show on the internet every week. But uh, they're closed today because they they have Monday through Friday business hours, as opposed to Joe that's opened up quite a bit. But uh, the annual fan drive is is a great event where, and it's a great idea. They're basically just trying to collect as many fans as possible. Their, their goal is to hit a hundred. Uh, and, and what they're going to do is they're going to give those fans to the Salvation Army, and then the Salvation Army is going to give it to needy families and seniors in the area. Uh, we've been blessed with some beautiful weather the last couple of days. And quite honestly, Friday night at the pits at I-80 Speedway, I was getting a little chilly. 
And last night we were sitting in the media center at Iowa Speedway, and we were getting cold. We had to walk outside, and it was it wasn't that much warmer outside. Well, yeah. By the by, the time the evening rolled around, I mean that one time there about four in the afternoon, we both walked mm-hmm. outside to get some heat. But uh, the point is, is that uh, we've we've had a little bit of a reprieve from the weather, but it's coming back this week. I, I hate to be a Debbie Downer, but we're going to see upper nineties again, which means the heat indexes could get well into the triple digits, up into the one hundred fives, one tens. And man, it's hard. It's hard to stay cool when you're an elderly citizen. You're on a budget. You can't afford an air conditioning bill every month. You can't afford a lot of this stuff. A fan can literally, and without overstating it, could be the difference between life and death. Well, as I get up there in years, I notice. I mean, your body's just not as efficient cooling itself as what it is when you're younger. Yeah, and the heat just kills me anymore. It's hard, but just having a fan blow on you can make a huge difference. Just moving that air can really make a big difference, and it's a great event. So do yourself do 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 the right thing. Go over to Home Depot. Go to Walmart, Target, Sears, wherever you prefer to shop. Baker's, Shopco, uh, Sam's Club, and, and just buy a simple box fan. That's all it takes. So you don't have to buy any amazing oscillating fan. You don't have to buy a Dyson that loop that weird looking. Uh, it almost looks like it's a giant um, hula hoop bubble blower. You know, <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> but uh, uh, but you don't have to buy any kind of a fancy fan. They just have to move the air a little bit. Even a little fan, a little box fan that can sit on a, a table, a nightstand, whatever, and blow on you will really make a big difference for these people that are that are going to have to fight through the heat of next week and the rest of August without uh, all the uh, amenities that the air conditioning can do. And that was one of my big questions with some of these drivers. Air conditioning was my creature comfort uh, last week. I I mean, I, I hardly ever like to run my air conditioner because I'm trying to save as much money as possible with the electrical bill. But, uh, man, last week there was no... <laughs> no avoiding it. We had, I was getting out to I eighty Speedway for the Silver Dollar Nationals on Friday. I got out there at noon to turn the air conditioner on to to hope that it would have time to cool that booth down before Green Flag uh, and before we got to really doing a lot of announcing at six o'clock that night. And I mean, it didn't do a lick of good. <laughs> but uh, that's just the way the summer is, and the uh, the uh, the Silver Dollar Nationals are. But uh, all right, let's get to Eric Jones, who uh, is the driver that ever twenty four. Joe Gibbs Racing, by the way. I think we helped him out with that win last night. Hey, we have that we have that kind of effect on people for some reason. I think did he start on pole or outside pole? Outside pole. Okay. So he started front row, outside pole. Suarez had the pole. Did not it was a good battle, about three, four laps between him and Daniel Suarez to get that lead. Once Jones had it though, he was out in that clean air and he just he ran his line nice and steady as he is he's becoming so accustomed to. And uh, he just he I would say he walked away with it, but his crew on pit road during those final stops got him a little bit behind the ball he started for uh, third on the restart he was inside row two and um once that happened he, he had a little tougher time getting through the field and him and ty Dillon had a really good battle for a while there well ty ran real hard and ty kind of used his stuff up and so when eric did get it by him i'm going to say what was it 15 20 laps to go yep. something like that it was yep. right towards the end you know he didn't have anything left and, and Ty really needed that win, too. I mean, Ty's good in the points as far as the Xfinity Series chase grid is concerned. But the win but is nice. the win locks you in. The win is that security blanket. Eric had two, now has three, and Ty's still left there looking for his win. And, and he was really disappointed yesterday after qualifying, really down on himself, because he, he's having a tough time figuring this track out. Well, he was leading the race yesterday, so he's got it. He's got something figured out at least for race day, but practice or for qualifying, he needs to get something else figured out. Well, the whole RCR camp was kind of out a mm-hmm. little bit yesterday. All right, let's talk with Eric Jones. So yesterday we sat down to the number twenty hauler for Joe Gibbs Racing and uh, talked with Eric about his career. We kicked it off by saying, um, "How did you get exposed to racing?" Uh, I got started when I was seven years old, and um, quarter midgets. You know, it wasn't a family thing or anything uh, like that. Just something that I enjoyed. Uh, was cars, and then um, my uh, my family got me involved in quarter midgets after we read about it in a magazine. So, uh, just something early on that I got started in and took off on, and and uh, and found an early interest in. You've risen through the ranks pretty quickly. I mean, it, it seems like you get into a sport, you you win at it quite a quick, pretty quickly, and then you rise again, rise again. Are you surprised at how fast you're moving up through the ranks? Uh, yeah, some sometimes, yeah. You know, you look back at it, and I haven't, uh, I haven't really been in a series full time at least for more than one year. So, I uh, had a, fu- a a couple part time seasons in the truck series, 
uh, part-time season in the Xfinity Series and now full-time season in both the Xfinity and the Truck Series. So uh, it's been a fun ride. You know, it's been fast, and I've been having to learn a lot really quick and intake a lot of information really quick, but uh, I've enjoyed every second of it. As fast as you've moved up to the series, you feel like you're kind of a veteran in the Xfinity Series now that you got like a whole year under your belt? <laughs> no, I don't know about that. I um, I definitely feel comfortable here and definitely feel, you know, good about what we do in, in the Xfinity Series, but definitely don't feel like a veteran. I, I'm still learning things every week. Um, you know, smaller things now than what they used to be, uh, little nuances about the sport and, and these cars and everything else. So um, definitely a lot to learn still and definitely figuring it out every week. Getting the ride with Kyle Busch Motorsports, did Kyle call you directly and talk to you about the ride? No, it was actually a, a kind of a, it was an interesting meeting. I actually met with somebody else, a different team at the time, and um, they didn't really have any room, and, and they had been in touch with Kyle, and, and uh, I know I had known Kyle a little bit beforehand and, and started talking to him some and, and found out he had an opportunity for a few races in the 51, uh, and I was able, lucky enough to fill those races. So uh, a little bit of a weird scenario, but uh, all in all, it worked out at the end of the day. You were interviewing for one job and got hired for another? Yeah, I was. I wasn't even interviewing. I was trying to pitch myself for one job and, and ended up getting another opportunity. So it it, it all worked out, uh, and uh, definitely an interesting one. Did you have to pinch yourself when you got that opportunity, or was it kind of like head down? I got to do the best I can absolutely do. I was kind of all you know, just go out and, and doing the best I could. Um, you know, at the end of the day, I can only do so much behind the wheel and and do the best I can. But uh, I was excited about it. Uh, definitely when I when it all came together and knowing I was going to have the five race opportunity, I saw it as really my only shot at the time uh, either way, and we were fortunate enough to have it work out, get a win at the end of it all, and, and, uh, and put it in some more races uh, for the next year. You once said that Tony Stewart was your biggest autograph you ever got, and when I read that article and read that information, it was about a year and a half ago. Do you, have you guys ever got to talk to him about how cool it was, the experience was to get the autograph from him? I never have. I haven't got the chance to tell him that story, um, but that was definitely the coolest experience for me as a kid. I was probably eight or nine years old and got his autograph, and he was, uh, you know, so so kind to me at the time and wished me good luck in the quarter midgets and everything else. And that was pretty cool for me, but uh, I haven't got the chance to tell him about that. How mind blowing is it that you're now in that position of Tony Stewart, where when you sit down for an autograph session? you can be that guy that influences the quarter midget driver that could be the next big driver in NASCAR in 10 years. Well, it's it's interesting. You know, it's uh, such a different perspective of it than what you see on the other side of things. And it's it's you know, I'm very fortunate to be in some kind of position like that. But uh, it's definitely cool to get to see the kids that come up, especially the ones that do race, and they can tell me about uh, what they're doing and what they're racing and, and how it's all going. I always, uh, always enjoy that because I know the feeling and, and know what it was like not too long ago to be that same kid coming up and, and trying to share that story. Yeah, please don't develop a man crush on Tony Stewart because you'll make Dan very upset. <laughs> very upset. <laughs> Biggest Stewart fan I know right here. There you go. Uh, fast forward to this season uh, with the new chase format. How much relief did you get when you got that win? Obviously, I know you're a confident driver. You're a very good driver. So you had to know going through the year that you were going to find a win somewhere. But getting it out of the way fairly early, how much relief was that for you? It was nice. You know, yeah, I, I, I figured at some point we'd have a chance to win a race and hopefully get a win. But uh, to knock it out that early in the season was definitely comforting and knowing that uh, we were most likely going to be locked in the chase from that. So definitely a good feeling for us, especially being such a young team and a new team relatively at the start of the season. To get it all gelling that quick was pretty uh, pretty special for us. So get that win knocked out and then get a second win at Dover a few weeks later was really nice and got a lot of momentum going for us. So uh, we're still trying to keep that going. And we've had fast cars every week since then and, and trying to get another win here soon. We, we were talking about your rise through the career and how, you know, you're kind of a younger guy and, and you know, doing very well. But um, it seems like your biggest hurdle in your career has been being old enough to drive. How frustrating is it to know you're talented enough, but there's a rule that says – the number's not big enough for you yet. Well, I was fortunate. Um, you know, when I first started in late models, I was 13 years old, and it was right around the time where, you know, that was becoming acceptable, and now it's becoming less acceptable, funny enough, in the late model world. And um, I was fortunate not to struggle with it too much on that side of things. But when I got to the NASCAR side, I, I was fortunate again that they changed the truck rules in 2013 to 16 for tracks a mile and under, so I was fortunate there again. But I felt like I was ready to run on the mile and a half at that point and, and couldn't do it for a couple more years. So um, that was probably the most frustrating one for me. But, you know, I think all in all, it, it all worked out for the best. And the experience I did get before um, really getting to do everything else was probably uh, more beneficial for me than I could ever have imagined. A lot of society today is uh, 
aided by creature comforts. Mine last week was definitely my air conditioner. I heard it was hot in Indianapolis where you guys were at. I mean, it was hot pretty much all over the country. What's some of your creature comforts that you have to have at the track? At the track, man, somewhere to go that's cool, um, number one. Um, but other than that, I, I don't have too many other creature comforts. I like to uh, kind of take it easy, and, and when I get here, I kind of put my phone to the side and, and kind of focus on what's at hand. But uh, other than that, you know, it's uh, it's pretty, uh, pretty easy going for me. Are you a Pokemon Go fan? I've never played it. Okay. I've never played it. That's that's apparently that's got to be asked by all now because it's so big. Uh, you know, um, and, and the other, I know one of the questions I have for you guys was uh, NASCAR is very unprecedented in the access to the drivers, and with some of the security issues as of recent, do you worry that maybe it's going to have to get drawn back a little bit so that you drivers are a little more protected? No, I don't think so. I think um, I think NASCAR does a good job of, of screening it, and they've stepped it up behind the scenes more th- more so than people realize. But uh, all in all, I think it's pretty um, pretty neat for us to have that fan access. You don't see it in any other sport, even any other form of, of motorsports. So um, for now, I think we've got a good system. They have stepped up security some behind the scenes, and it's uh, uh, I think we all know as drivers, they're doing the best they can to to uh, keep us safe and keep everybody else safe on pit road. So we had a question that we asked a lot of drivers, and hopefully. Alicia sent it over to you a little bit ahead of time, but if you could change anything about racing, and again, it, it doesn't have to be realistic, logical, it could defy the laws of nature if it wants to, what would be one thing you would change about racing? That's a good question. Uh, Alicia didn't send that to me beforehand, okay. just so you know. <laughs> um, but, uh, man, there's a lot of things you could change. I guess one of the biggest things I would change is, you know, I wish there was some sort of, not necessarily draft, but some way for young guys to break into the sport easier. Uh, it's so tough, you know, nowadays for a young guy to get into it, even if he's talented on the short track level. And it was hard for me to even get on the, get in on the ground level in this sport. So if there's one way to, to have a more formalized system of getting young talent into the sport, I think that'd be pretty neat. One last question before we let you go. Fast forward five years. What is on your hero card as big accomplishments that you've had? <laughs> Man, I hope it's uh, I hope it's Xfinity Truck Champion number one, and um, hopefully a Cup winner at that point. I think that'd be three three big things for me that I'd be pretty proud of at that point in my life. And you know, I hope at that point I'd, I'd be in the Cup Series and hopefully challenging to to try to get all three of those championships. That's a a big goal, long term goal for me is to be able to contend for all three Series championships and, and hopefully be able to first one to do it. Eric Jones, one of the big talents in our sport in the Xfinity Series, another one of your hurdles. Now you got to wait for one of those rides in the Cup Series to open up. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, we'll uh, we'll see what happens. But uh, it's been a fun ride in the Xfinity Series so far, and in the Truck Series as well. And um, you know, when that when that time arises, I'll hopefully be ready for it. Thanks for your time. Thank you. So again, that was Eric Jones who ended up getting the win last night here at Iowa Speedway, and uh, good race last night. Good interview with Eric. Yeah, um, like I said, we brought him the luck like we usually bring it, you know, and uh, but a very talented young man. It's uh, uh, talking to both those guys yesterday. I mean, one of them started when he was very young. One mm-hmm. didn't start till he was 13, so a little different paths. Um, the one that did start when he was younger, I think at this stage in their career, his extra experience is paying off. Yeah, absolutely. All right, we're going to take a quick break. We'll come back. We'll have a little bit more of an extended, well, an extended turn four than we normally do. It's not going to be the usual two, three-minute turn four. We'll actually have a full turn four to talk about Pocono and to recap I-80 Speedway to talk about some other news stories. This is a turn four in Pocono's honor since they don't have one. (laughs) Amen. (laughs) We'll be back here on the front stretch. Joe's Karting and Council Bluffs has taken a page out of IMCA's rulebook and gone crate. These brand new low emission engines will still have you white knuckling it all through the Metro's fastest indoor facility. Joe's Karting is now friendly for all skill levels with their brand new Honda powered engines. It's time to get to Joe's today and find out what drivers like Jack Dover, Shaley Bate, and Andrew Kosicki have known for years. Located in Council Bluffs and online at Joe'sKarting.com. That's Karting with a K. Quaker Steak and Lube is the official watering hole for the front stretch and the best place to catch all the NASCAR action today. Open at 11 a.m. with delivery available to Council Bluffs. Great times, great food, get to Quaker Steak and Lube. Are you looking to book your next outing? 
Look no further than Joe's Carding in Council Bluffs. Located just north of Bass Pro Shop, Joe's Carding can handle outings of well over 100 plus people. Bachelor parties, corporate outings, team building, birthday parties, and much more. Give Buddy a call today and reserve your outing. Joe's will even work with local restaurants to cater your event. Book yours today at joescarding.com. That's Carding with a K. It's time to get to Joe's and find out what everyone already knows. Dan and Dirk are live for one last corner. Give them a call now at 402-573-0590. Pocono Raceway, just about ready to kick off today. About, uh, what, four hours till the green flag is scheduled. Key to <laughs> schedule. <laughs> uh, it looks like there's going to be rain in the forecast for day today. Looking at the tweets from the NASCAR weatherman, uh, who is not, I think, actually affiliated with NASCAR, but uh, calls himself the NASCAR weatherman. Looking at the Pocono forecast, looks like there's about a 60% chance of rain uh, around the green flag time, and then there's a window there where they could get half of the race in, and it could be official, and then uh, looks like there's more storms coming at about 10 o'clock tonight in the uh, Pocono area in Pennsylvania, rain tomorrow, rain tomorrow night, so... You know, if they don't get it to halfway, they could probably end up finishing the remainder of the race at least a halfway point tomorrow. So keep that in mind. But here's the thing for the Pickums contest: don't bet on the rain. We've learned that a numerous times. When I've I've bet on the rain coming in, and so I've made other plans to do things that day, and then the rain never came, and I got to watch the NASCAR race and had to cancel my plans. Which you know, not bad for me, bad for those I canceled on. But uh, don't don't if when the Pickums contest is coming up. Uh, your looks like the uh, green flag set to wave at about 12:30 today on NBC and uh, PRN. Uh, don't bank on the rain. Get your picks in, get them in quick. In fact, I'm looking at the uh, front stretch email right now, and I've got a lot of picks that have come in already. Not to mention, uh, oddly enough, Martin Truex Jr. a very popular pick, and I'm getting quite a few uh, Pulmonar picks. And Jeff Gordon's available too, by the way, yeah. if you want to take Jeff Gordo. Yeah, I mean, Jeff, he showed he still got it. Last week was a solid run. It wasn't yeah. really impressive, and uh, you never know. I mean, he was always good at gas mileage. All right, let's talk about some of the results from I-80 Speedway on Friday night. We had some new first-time winners and some regulars in victory lane for the Super Light Model feature event. Corey Zeitner got the win uh, over Ben Schaller, Bill Layton Jr., Jace Kazer, Brian Kaziski. I felt really bad uh, for Bill Coons. He had that car. He had the best car out there and just absolutely laying down some blazing fast laps. But uh, like we talked about on the way over here, I was really surprised, despite how cool it was, a lot of engines were overheating in those super late models on Friday night. And well, we had uh, three of them that retired because of uh, heating issues. Yeah, well, I mean, if, if the track's a little muddy early and you get some uh, a lot of that mud up in the radiator early and it gets a chance to bake in there, it can cause you problems later on in the evening. So Coons had to retire. That surrendered the lead to Corey Zeitner, who never gave it up after that and got the win. Uh, J- Jared Heffelman in the A-Mods. It was a nice A-Mod feature with Travis Hatcher, Jared Heffelman, Justin Gray, Clinton Homan, all battling for the win, and I'm I'm becoming a big fan of the A mods, the uh in the stock cars at I80 because it's four or five guys that are winning, uh that could easily win every week. Uh, Heffelman's got several wins on the season. He's doing really well for himself. But Justin Gregg, uh, after a USMTS race last week during the Silver Dollar Nationals, he won two weeks for the NASCAR Weekly Racing Action. Clinton Holman has won. Jesse Dennis has won. Justin Zeitner has won. Um, I think even Scott Carlson's won. There's been a lot of guys that have won in that in that class, and they put on a good 3-4 battle for the lead. Well, stock cars slash pro-ams have been one of the most competitive classes for mm-hmm. a very long time. Yeah, and, and speaking of the stock cars, um, even though Scott Carlson walked away with it on Friday night, um, Jim Hendricks Jr., Larry Robinson, and Nick Woodard were really battling. And that's that's a great thing about, I was just talking about the stock cars and the, and the modifieds, uh, and what you have said about NASCAR racing in general is that, you know, on TV, you only see what, what the TV camera shows you. There's a lot of battling through the field. And for those stock cars, the B mods and the A mods, there's a lot of battling going on through the field, even if the leader does have a straightaway lead. Yeah, like normally... Um, in the stock car class, usually you've got several cars mm-hmm. up 
battling for the front, you know, yeah. uh, four or five cars normally. And, you know, if one guy really hits the setup and the track comes to him, like evidently it did for Scott Friday, mm-hmm. you know, and then you probably still had a, a three or four car battle for second place that was probably pretty intense. Absolutely. And to see little Larry Robinson up there in third was good to see him. Uh, he's new into this sport and, and slowly getting used to that car. Nick Woodard, Nick, uh, Dr. Nick Steyer, and Tim Pedraza. Uh, by the way, thoughts and prayers goes out to uh, the crewman for Tim Pedraza who had an issue early in the race and they had to uh, send him to the hospital. So uh, we're sending our thoughts to him. Uh, a lot of great racing action throughout the Midwest this weekend. And it, I, I wish that, that, that uh, going back a little bit, Kyle Larson, when he won at Eldora a couple of weeks ago, and, and he was talking about you know how great it was to race on dirt. And a lot of people were watching that race for the first time as Camper World Truck Series fans and not understanding, like I didn't understand six years ago, that there is dirt racing like that locally all throughout the country every Friday night, Saturday night, Sunday night, some Thursday nights, a couple of Wednesday nights. There's plenty of dirt racing to go and see. Depending on where you're at, I mean, you get over into Iowa, you can go six, six seven nights a week. Easy. Mm-hmm. Ab- absolutely. Uh, all right, so the racing action today at Pocono. Let me pull up my stats sheet here real quick so I can get to what we did um Last year. Why do you need a stat sheet? The fastest guy always wins. <laughs> <laughs> the first guy uh, to the checkered wins, and then the fun is done. Earlier this year, Kurt Busch got the win. And I say earlier this year. It was like six weeks ago, wasn't it? Yeah, it was June 5th. Uh, Kurt Busch got the win. Dale Earnhardt Jr., who isn't racing today, ended up finishing second. Brad Kozlowski, third. Chase Elliott, fourth. Joey Logano ended up fifth. Casey Kane, Matt Kins, and Carl Edwards. Kevin Harvick and Ryan Blaney round out the top ten. The old mileage race was think, boring. No, it wasn't boring. It was a really good race because we had a lot of fun talking about those restarts where they were going, they would go four or five wide through the straightaway, but then they have to dive down and get single file into the corners because despite how wide that corner is, there's, there's not a wide there's, groove. Yeah, there's an eight foot groove, mm-hmm. and that's it. And they're they're using every bit of it, but uh, it, it was a fun race at Pocono. I do like Pocono. I think it's a fun race. It is a little bit rougher when it, it comes down to a fuel mileage race, and there's 10, 15 seconds between leaders or between placemen. But uh, today's race could be really interesting. I don't expect that today. I think there's going to be a lot of really hard racing throughout the entire race because of the threat of rain. Well, yeah, if, if they get the green flag as scheduled... Uh, what were we looking at on the Weather Channel a little while ago? There's only like a 50-50 chance that they'll even get to the halfway point. Yeah. it's There's about a four- or five-hour window where there isn't rain expected, and that's as of right now. We know how fast the weather can change. This could blow out pretty easily, and we could have a full race today. Uh, but there's there's about a four- or five-hour window there where it's going to take them probably an hour, hour and a half to get the track clear and then get out there and do the uh, do the race. So if they can get a good two hours of racing in, then they'll get halfway, a little over halfway, and we should get uh, this race official. So yeah, it's going to be mean, really interesting to see what happens today. And halfway at this track is two fuel stops because it's only going to be 75 laps to get to halfway. Mm-hmm. you got the Bush brothers back. They make up the eighth row, mm-hmm. so they don't have time to jack around and pick off a car every 10 laps and you know maybe make up a spot on a pit stop. They've got to. They got to press it. They got to get going. Martin Truex Jr., Carl Edwards start on row number one. Paul Menard at Denny Hamlin row two. Ryan Newman, Tony Stewart row three. Brad Keselowski, Chase Elliott row four. Kenseth and Logano row five. Larson and Dillon row number six. You, like you said, you have to go back to row number eight for positions fifteen and sixteen for the Bush brothers. But um, I don't expect them to be back there for very long. Well, no, they shouldn't be. Like I said, they got to get busy and they got to get after it. And I think Jimmy Johnson's back there somewhere too. And he had a, a quick car in one of the early practices and has won there before, obviously. Uh, so, Johnson is starting twenty first. Yeah, so he's going to be trying to pick him off. Gordon you know. starting twenty eighth. There's going to be a lot of racing. Yeah, there's going to be. <laughs> I'm I'm excited about that. As I'm looking back and I'm seeing some of the guys starting 15th on back, that's going to make for some good racing for a while. Turn number four brought to you by Quaker Steak and Lubin in Council Bluffs, the official watering hole of the front stretch. A lot going on. The summer is starting to wind down, but there's still plenty of amazing stuff going on at Quaker Steak and Lube. The eighth annual golf tournament coming up August 8th. If you want to get involved in that, contact Chris at Quaker Steak and Lube, 323-0101. That's 712-323-0101. Amazing prizes through that golf tournament and then uh what coming up uh wednesday night is bike night again with live music from mr sinister 
Thursday night classic car cruising as always. Friday night some great specials. Uh, what Tuesday nights all you can eat wings. Monday night is kids night. A lot of great things going on at the official watering hole of the front stretch. Not to mention they will have all the green flag action for today's race on the big screens. And the past Monday truck night looked like it was packed as always. Touch mm-hmm. a truck. Yeah, it was. It, it was. That was a really cool event. I love that event a lot. Uh, it's it's such a simple thing where kids get to go out and actually touch the vehicles that you see out on the spe- out on the roads. If it's a fire truck or if it's a it's a military transport or even a helicopter, a or crane, a race car, a race car, a Quaker uh, with uh, with I think Jack Dover was out there. Hey, there were plenty of kids your age touching stuff the other day. <laughs> well, I was I, I was wondering, I was trying to get Jack to let me sit down in, in the uh, in the car last time I was out there for a touch truck and he wouldn't let me. I think he knows better. Even Between, though they don't have a starter, so you know you can't drive <laughs> off with it. I'd find a way to break it. Uh, we got just a little bit left, uh, so we'll talk a little bit of news. Uh, big story coming out this week that a federal judge has ruled that the insurance company of Tony Stewart is not liable to pay any damages he may incur from the Kevin Ward situation. So. Tony is currently in a lawsuit with the Ward family. They did sue him for damages and uh, loss of property uh, because they felt like uh, Kevin was going to was a there was a dollar of value attached to Kevin as a race car driver, and they feel like Tony took that away from them. So they have sued him. The insurance company notified Tony that they would not be paying for the if he lost any kind of a civil suit or lawsuit, and so he took them to federal court. And he lost. So if a judge finds that Tony Stewart is liable for damages due to Kevin Ward's death, then Tony's going to have to pay that out of pocket. Well, I know an insurance company that just lost Tony Stewart's business. Absolutely. And And I can imagine that was pretty good business. Well, I can't imagine. Insurance (laughs) companies make a lot of money. I don't think they're going to really be hurting if they lose one client, even though it's Tony Stewart. Hey, if if it comes out in the news that they don't have to pay nothing, they're going to lose a lot of business because a lot of other people are going to think the same thing. They won't pay for me. I'm moving. But before you jump on an insurance, I think think they were absolutely right in this. As much as I love an insurance cover to... Tony or an insurance company to do their job, uh, that was not a race that was on Tony Stewart's co- uh, coverage. That was not a race that he had put on his schedule. He did a one-off because they were at Pocono that weekend, so he was technically not covered by his insurance during that race. And so, you know, when when they set up this agreement, he had X amount of races in his World of Outlaws car. He had X amount of races as a part of his NASCAR coverage. He had X amount of races a part of his All Star coverage. This did not fall into any of those. And so, when they originally agreed to cover him that year, this race was not on the schedule. Well, I would certainly think though that a man of Tony Stewart's means, and I'm sure he's got some very smart business managers, Mm -hmm. I would think he would have had some type, some type of an umbrella policy that covered everything, every step, every breath, whatever Tony Stewart as a person does. Sounds like they thought they were covered, and the insurance found a way to not cover them. Well, so uh, that's, that's going to be a story. Job. That will be a story that will develop. We're if a little bit over now, so we're going to take a break. 3rd, we'll come back. We'll be back next weekend uh, on the, the front stretch on AM five ninety Omaha's ESPN Radio. ESPN Omaha.